All right, um, thank you all for coming tonight. It's a great crowd. Um, my name is Gary Carrion Mariari. I'm um, the Krauss family curator here at the New Museum, and um, I'm one of the curators of uh, the exhibition on the second floor, uh, John Acumper, Signs of Empire. Um, we're very um, pleased to have you here tonight, um, and especially to have um, John here, as well as um, uh, the producers of um, the works in the show, um, David Lawson and Lena Gopal. Um, John, David, and Lena have been working together for uh, more than 30 years now, I think, um, which is a, I think, truly incredible collaboration. And I think it was, uh, for us at the New Museum, um, this was a very ambitious project, but also it, I think it was one of um, one of the projects we're most proud of, and we're really you know grateful to to John and David and Lena for all of the work, um, the the technical work and the intellectual work that went into the project. So, um, uh, hopefully, you'll have a chance to talk more to them um, in a bit. Um, just to give you a little bit of an introduction, um, uh, the exhibition is on the second floor. There's four installations there um, that kind of span the duration of John's career. Um, on Wednesdays here in the theater, um, as part of our screening series, we're going to be showing four um, other um, sort of key works um, that John and Black Audio Film Collective um, produced um, over the course of their career. So Hands Were Song, Songs, uh, Testament, uh, Seven Songs for Malcolm X, and The Last Angel of History, all of which are, I think are incredibly important works, and hopefully you'll come back on Wednesdays to see those as well. Um, to give you a very, very brief um, biographical introduction, um, John um, was born in Ghana in 1957. Um, he currently lives and works in London. Um, you've probably seen um, his work um, in many places across the world over the past several years. Um, he um, most recently was in uh, as an exhibition at the Nasher Museum um, in Durham, North Carolina, um, SF MoMA, uh, the Tizen Boromisva in Madrid, um, an incredible installation called Purple at the Barbican uh, last year. Um, he was also in um, the 2015 Venice Biennale with Vertigo C, which is the centerpiece of our exhibition here. Um, he was in the last Prospect uh, exhibition in New Orleans, um, the Sharjah Biennial in um, 2013, which is where I first encountered um, uh, the Unfinished Conversation, and um, numerous other exhibitions in the past, and I think working into the future. So um, as always, John and David and Lena are in the midst of lots of projects, so we're very grateful they were able to be with us tonight. Um, and I think we'll get started. We'll have, we'll talk for a bit, um, you know, a, a bit casually about the works that are in the show, and we'll leave some time for questions at the end. Um, so first off, John, thank you. Um, to get started, um, you know, we, um, this exhibition, you know, is the New York premiere of Vertigo C, and I think for us it's also, um, you know, I, for those of us who saw it in Venice, I think it, it also is a kind of different presentation. It's, um, the scale has, has grown a bit, and I think it's, um, probably closer to you know, how you've intended it and shown it in, in recent years. Um, uh, and also, I think you've done a lot of great work you know, tweaking things. And so it is, <laughs> it is also an un, uh, a, a still a work. Um, I'm not supposed to say that. That's a, but it's, you know, <laughs> I think all great artists, nothing is you're never completely satisfied. So that's um, a good thing. But I, um, you know, I wanted to start um, to talk a little bit about um, uh, one of the aspects of the piece that I think is really um, important and challenging to me is the way that can, there are different historical voices that kind of speak to each other across the show and uh, across the work. Um, and you know, a lot of your work has been in, you know, invested in looking at um, and kind of reconstructing you know, uh, important historical narratives that had not yet been told. Um, in this case, you know, as, as far as I, I know the story of the work, you know, initially you were inspired um, by narratives of um, Nigerian migrants to Europe um, and their experience um, crossing to the sea. So I'm, I'm interested in, you know, partially what attracted you to that initial narrative, but how you kind of collected these voices from the past to speak to the present in such a, um, I think, so in such an unusual way. Um, Gary, thank you very much, not just for agreeing to do this with <laughs> me, um, um, but also your wholehearted and complete support for the exhibition. It's, it's remarkable. I mean, oftentimes people think artists do a lot. We actually don't do very much for these <laughs> exhibitions. <laughs> well, certainly ones like me anyway. We sort of leave it all to people like David, um, my colleague and partner, and, and Gary, and they figure out the voodoo which makes these things work. So um, thank you to you and Massimiliano. I mean, um, I'm, I'm going to evade the question because it's a difficult one to answer. Uh, <laughs> But, but the reasons for the difficulty really has to do with how the works come into form. Um, and the question you're asking me is precisely 
what informs the search for the form mm -hmm. of the work. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I have uh, from the beginning always a set of itinerant troubadour kind of yearnings and ideas that I want to to see realized. On the whole, most of them are slightly disobedient in the sense that they don't want to speak to each other. Mm -hmm. they, you know, most people, you know, works have a, well, you know, like works are like people. Everyone thinks they're unique and individual. You know. or that's <laughs> like what you first have to do is to persuade a whole set of discrete, autonomous, largely self-contained entities that there is both an ethic and a value in having a conversation. Mm -hmm. but, but that's a tentative, provisional, pragmatic process of persuading things and people to, to mingle and co-mingle. Um, we knew, and that by we I mean myself, my collaborators, Devolt Okima who shoots, Pretty much everything I've done in the last 20 years, Linu and David, who you know raised the monies and cajole and da, 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 all of that. Um, and also most of the time come up with the ideas, it has to be said. Um, uh, we knew that there were a set of discrete chapters, uh, many of them uh, from periods of our lives when we were absolutely committed to things. And, and movements. So the Argentinian story comes from the period of the Chile solidarity campaigns of the mm -hmm. 70s when I was very, very young and I was part of that. Um, of course, the, the African stuff is pretty self-evident because mm -hmm. I'm a migrant and you know, mm -hmm. myself. <laughs> um, but some are also theoretical kind of uh, ideas, you know, the writings of Equiano and the whole abolitionist movement. You know. So things like that are, are all sometimes part of your past. And in a way, what the projects are about is to see whether they can be reimagined, reinterrogated slightly differently mm -hmm. in the present. You know. um, so it's a difficult question to answer because of those. Yeah, it's a very big question. I, you know, I think yes. <laughs> <laughs> that finding a form, it's something I'm sure we'll get back to it when we talk mm -hmm. about the other pieces as well. But um, you know, I think... I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if there was something different about this work in particular. You know, I think, you know, or you know, to a certain degree, are you surprised by, you know, how, you know, um, sort of powerfully this work has been received? Because I think, you know, because obviously, you know, this work is, you know, people are clamoring, clamoring to see this work across the world, the world these days. Not just because of, I think, you know, the timeliness of the subject matter, and obviously, this, you know, issues about, you know, migration and. And the Atlantic are things that have been in part of your work for quite some time, but I think there's, you know, the actual sensorial experience of this work is something that um, somehow feels different. And um, you know, is it been surprising, or is it something you've been able no, to yes. kind of pinpoint? What no, very um, surprising. Um, in part because I hadn't realized the extent to which. Um, no, many of the things I do are, are subjects I've returned to again and again and again. You know, the Cetacean world, um, the fate and fortunes of humpback whales are, are there in Handsworth songs, mm -hmm. 1985. You know, so for me, it didn't seem such a huge jump. But I, if I had to make sense of it, uh, looking and trying to read uh, the reception, I think in part people were surprised by it because it seemed such a an excessive display of affect. <laughs> you know, it, it seemed so emotional. Um, but that doesn't feel like a departure for me. You know, um, I don't know really. I don't know why it was so. Uh, but you're right to 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 pinpoint it as a kind of break, rupture in 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 the reception to the work. Certainly, right. I think, you know, Massimo and I talked a lot about kind of the way that you think about the sublime in that work. And obviously there is this kind of, you know, relationship to kind of romantic painting and, you know, a certain um, kind of emotion tied to, you know, obviously like culturally tied to our experience of the ocean more 
generally, and I think maybe it's somehow, you know, the scale relates to that on, on a certain level. Um, no, I think people, um, I, I'm always surprised that the people are so surprised by my attachment to romanticism as a movement and as an aesthetic, you know. Uh, and uh, my interest in Caspar um, David Friedrichs and the poetry of Byron and Shelley, and, you know, um, early words, word, all of that work um, is tied to how I see and, and feel their role, the emancipatory potential of Romanticism at a very specific point in our history. You know, mm -hmm. um, and at that point, when the discussion about what constitutes the human was being had, um, and when uh, many of us, certainly people of color, were seen to be outside the living rooms of that conversation, romanticism was the back door through which we entered that conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, So my attachment to romanticism is both dated by an interest in that historical epoch and what it threw up as a set of ideas about human potential. And, and it's sort of embrace of difference uh, mm -hmm. at the time. Okay, it came with problems later on, but uh, you know, nothing ever does not, <laughs> you know, as far as I'm aware. Um, but the other thing uh, about romanticism Especially, it's one of those words, concepts that are somehow bear too uncomfortable a resemblance <laughs> to their popular usage. Right. You know, um, so you say romanticism, and people immediately think romantic. Right. Understandably, right. you know, um, it couldn't be far from the case. I mean, you know, when you read the justifications for taking part in the Greek War of Independence by Byron. There's nothing romantic about it at <laughs> all, you know. Um, so I, I think in part that there's a mistaken belief that our, our attachment to that movement is in some ways a, a mimicking of um, old world notions of the sublime. It's not at all. I mean, I am completely attached to questions of the sublime, but not in in the way that people assume. You right. know, um, right. It's not the European <laughs> definitions of the sublime. It's not right. that I'm against the European definitions of the sublime, but I, I mean, I think one needs to update this question of the sublime, you know, because it's it's been understood in aesthetic and philosophical terms, but not always justified in ethical terms. Right. You know, and the ethical question really is this. We need a sense of the borders that organize our mortality. We need a sense of the limits by which we become and ultimately unbecome who we are. And in that grand debate, the questions of life and death <laughs> are really important and both are um, beautiful, should we say, or at least the attempt to combine them in some form that throws the question of mortality in very sharp relief is for me the question of the sublime. That's what the sublime is about. It's not about the awe of things. Or, right. you know, it's about trying to remind people in that very Japanese way about the fragility of things. That's what makes it. Yeah, and, it, and maybe that, you know, I think the urgency of those questions at this mm -hmm. moment, I think, is why asking it through that language is is affecting people so much right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that maybe. But it's important to it's important to to recast it in those terms, because otherwise um, uh, the the other important thing that we need to do cannot go ahead. You know, I mean, at the moment. There's a whole set of philosophical positions from the beginning of the century, uh, you know, the Heideggerian, blah, 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 all of which have said, you know, basically that um, uh, there is a stage of being and, and that uh, people, human beings, a human subject, whatever you want, 
has over occupied that, you know, um, th that we need to either <laughs> clear it a little bit or populate that stage with a few more mm. subjects. Uh, and it seems to me that if you, if you peg the sublime simply to questions of what we, i.e., the human subject, considers either beautiful, terrible, mm. blah, 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 then you lose the dimension mm -hmm. that I'm trying to get at. You know, and people are people are in part moved by uh, vertigo C because it's a bit like watching Bresson's Balthazar. You, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you, it's about in part about sperm, you know, uh, humpback whales and sperm whales and blue whales who don't speak yeah. in the traditional sense, but are clearly functioning as beings in in the piece, and that's important. So the the widening of what the sublime can constitute. Um, is for me a way of democratizing that stage of being so that others can occupy it with, with the same forcefulness, authority, um, and compelling presence that we have occupied it, uh, or some of us at least have occupied it for the last half a millennia. Well, maybe to redirect it, you know, um, you know I, I think I, I'm sure some of that, you know, uh, these questions are raised through the actual process of, of making, and I think yes. probably so the research, then the conversations that you and, and David and Lena have. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, like, you know, how um, you start to kind of build those questions through, you know, working through images, and you know, and how that kind of process of of research, ar archival research, and um, you know, original shooting and writing and reading, which is obviously a big you know part of what you do. You know, those films are meant to be read um, in, in a really, I think, important way. You know, treating them as texts also, I think, is is, is something that has helped me um, you know um, work through a lot of the ideas they're exploring. You know, how do you kind of um, uh, calibrate those different fields of activity that go into making something so ambitious? Um, uh, in the main, by treating all the component parts, elements, as palimpsests, you know, as um, uh, what do I mean? Well, you know, um, I shoot something, and the shoot is an, Im an invitation to an image to participate in a dialogue with um, something else, even something as banal and basic as sound of wind, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, and I have to pretend to it, or, you know, in that sense I'm not very honest with my partners in this. I have to pretend to it that when it comes into this space, it's going to be wholly itself. <laughs> uh, but that's not true. Right. It has to come in um, in part by foregoing some of its claims to full authority. Mm -hmm. um, and in this way, it becomes a palimpsest in the sense that it is erased, but it preserves a trace of itself. And after a while, if you have enough of these things, giving up enough of themselves, you know, something begins to happen. And it's, yeah. it's really, it's almost a, a quasi-mystical experience in the sense that, you know, you hear the call from uh, material, archival material, bits of music, noise, and so on. And, and they all say, to, you know, because you said to them, we're going on this journey, right. and they're all like, oh, <laughs> Hollywood film, they all say, are we there yet? And you go, no, 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 just a bit further. <laughs> But of course, the further they go, the more they yield of their autonomy and their independence. Um, so that you, what you want to do is to be able to arrive at a point where you've got a sequence or a, a segment, which is, let's say, five minutes mm -hmm. long, and people can watch it as a seamless whole. It's not seamless. It's a complete fiction. Right. <laughs> Um, because if, if you look at anything that I've done for five minutes, it will have, I don't know how many numbers of shots, it will have, I don't know how many. I mean, Vertigo C has 70 channels of sound. Oh my gosh, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, Purple had 350. 
you know, so um, there's a, when you break these things down forensically, you see the components that are being used to structure it. Um, but each one believes that it's an independent unit. <laughs> <laughs> and it has to continue yeah. to believe it's an independent unit in order for this symphony yeah. of difference to persist. You know, um, how it's provisional. I mean, uh, you know, it's project by project. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the work. The work yeah. is, to, is to both, um, I mean, I don't have, I have a, a grand plan always, but then the, s the minute the work starts and you're doing all this Butch Morris conduction thing, <laughs> <laughs> all these pieces then say, listen, motherfucker, <laughs> <laughs> you better give something up yourself yeah. because we're not doing this yeah. alone, you know. So at some point you have to go, okay, okay, let, let's all just do this. Let's open the gates of unreason and let's just see where this thing is going. And, and so you have to defer the question of uh, authorial intent for as long as possible. Um, and it is frightening, yes, because uh, there are moments when this stuff is gibberish. It's quite literally. <laughs> You know, Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> but, but at some point, it all kind of, you know, Hades appears in sight, and you know, there is a pier, and you, know, you, you kind of get that. I mean, there are obviously intellectual, political, emotional reasons why that happens, but in part, yes, you have to get lost at sea with yeah. this uh, in order for this to happen. Well, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, in relationship to the you know, the parts that you are filming, you know, on location, for instance. So, mm -hmm. you know, that image of Equiano, like, the, um, yes. which maybe we should, maybe you want to describe a little bit what, you know, the background of that story, because it is such a compelling story, but that image, you know, it, it takes on relationships with other images, you know, you know, surprising images in a, in a way that I think is one of the most kind of, you know, kind of uh, iconic moments of your recent work. I think that it's, it's such an, an amazing scene. Um, I love Equiano. I, he's he's just one of the most extraordinary human beings, really. Um, uh, enslaved, worked his way out of uh, slavery by buying his freedom, becomes an abolitionist writer, and so on. But the the moment when the um, when heroism calls and he's ready and embraces it, is the moment that we speak about in, in Vertigo C. So there's um, a ship called the Zog, uh, and the ship had uh, left the West African coast, I think the Bight of Guinea, so that suggests that it was probably, you know, Lagos or Elmina. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, um, not Lagos. Um, Senegal, uh, oh, names come, will come to me in a minute. Dakar, but before Dakar, Saint Louis. Um, and they make a set of navigational blunders, uh, think they might not arrive at, uh, in Jamaica with cargo, and so decide to dump most of the enslaved at sea. Um, now, the only reason we know about this is because of a, a kind of weird loop in the law. Because not only did they do that, they then went to England and claimed <laughs> insurance on the losses. So that became a test case, and someone's, uh, a Quiano found this out, he gave it to Granville Sharp, you know, it became a kind of major cost alert and um, they lost the case. And it was decided you couldn't kill people and also be paid <laughs> for it, you know. Um, uh, and Equiano was, was central in that. And th this is one of the moments when I, uh, I talk about my affinity with the Romantic movement because a very, very large number of the intellectuals of the day in Britain 
who came from that movement rallied to this case and used it as the sort of charismatic example for their argument of the great chain of being in which you should find people of African descent. You know, um, so I'm I'm very fond of Equinox <laughs> uh, for for all sorts of reasons, and um, I, you know he's just one of those people who. Um, Over the years, I've tried to do things with lots and lots and lots of people, narratives or stories and histories and chapters and episodes. And at some point, you know, you, you can't force things. You know, he hadn't fitted anything, really, until now. You know, um, the same with the Blue Well sequences. You know, I, I've tried them over the years in different mm -hmm. kinds of projects. And, you know, and at some point, this is where the, the, the projects are kind of um, truly democratic experiments because you know, you, you're pushing this guy, let's just call a sequence or a segment a guy for a moment, <laughs> um, and you have to really listen to, because at some point, it, they will start to tell you whether they fit, whether they belong. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the past, when I have listened, they've usually said, no, you know, <laughs> this is not, you know, like, I don't belong <laughs> with these guys. <laughs> I mean, I, most of the time you have to uh, accept that there is hubris at work and, and really interrogate why uh, subjects or characters might say that. But, you know, if in the end they are stubborn enough in their persistence that they don't belong, you have to listen. Mm -hmm. So I pulled him out and pulled him out. And this just felt right. He felt right. Um, to go a little bit off subject, I mean, was it the same? I mean, how did that relate to the experience with the uh, Peace for Prospect, where we're looking at Buddy Bolden, like, it's so, you know, focused yes. on this particular historical figure. Mm -hmm. um, and, yes. and then in a lot of ways, you know, the material kind of dances around him, whereas with Equiano, he seems to be kind of unmoored in this. Uh, well, I mean, you know, the, the um, it's interesting, actually. Equiano has a voice. So there's a you know, right. segment in it where he speaks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we know that because it was written somewhere. You know. mm -hmm. Bowdoin is the, is the other side of, of diaspora. It's, it's diaspora as a kind of absence of ruin. You know, uh, the, the absence of, of tangible traces and deposits that attest to, to either African lives or Jewish lives. Mm -hmm. You know, most diasporas float mm -hmm. on oralities. You know, there's very little uh, else. Um, and the question with the case of uh, precarity was whether I went with that drift, you know, or tried to to do the Hollywood fiction, give him a voice and right. that. I mean, we went halfway, <laughs> you know. Um, but in the end, I just couldn't, I couldn't go that extra mile. I couldn't, it felt better to use Bowdoin to speak about the, the sort of uh, border, border lines, if you like, of diaspora, mm -hmm. rather than um, do what we did with, with Aquiano and Vertigo C, which was to yank him out of obscurity fully clothed, voiced, motivations, intentions, blah, 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 blah. That didn't feel right somehow. So, you know, there's a section in precarity when you finally get to the performance and you expect to hear it, um, hear Bowdoin play, you know, and uh, I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's silent. I mean, you watch them perform, but you don't hear what they play. I, I just couldn't go that extra mile with that fiction. Mm -hmm. you know. That makes sense. Um, well, I also wanted to ask you, you know, uh, we're talking about the kind of the use of whale footage and, and you know, we did uh, um, maybe sort of counterintuitively, you know, we have three relatively recent works and then we also have Signs of Empire, which is the first work that you guys sort of made as a group. Um, and, you know, so much of your work has been, I think, I think the, the, the kind of influence it's having on younger artists right now is thinking about archives in a way that's 
much more fluid and lyrical and alive than you know I think has been used in you know by other artists in the past. And I'm wondering, like, you know, how is it, you know, how is that experience of working with archives? How do you approach it differently? Because I know there's a great um, passage in um, in Zoe's um, text in the catalog, Zoe Whitley's text in the catalog, where she's talking about. I think she got some stories from Lena about how you guys were scavenging for materials to make that piece, and you know, buying books and taking photographs and then returning the books, and and now you're working with something like the BBC Natural History Unit, and you have like you know, um, you know, yes. uh, how does it evolve? To, you know, to um, well, you know. I mean. Um, <laughs> Uh, the tape slides, uh, the expedition series that you saw upstairs, uh, that you will see upstairs, anyone who wants to, um, were made in exactly the way that Lena described. It's sort of DIY, very Jamie Reed punk, you know, <laughs> use what's available, that kind of, you know. Um, but to put it that way, it makes it sound is something romantic and it wasn't at all. This was the Necessity. conditions yeah. of existence yeah. of black art practice in the early 80s in England. It's just, um, I remember going to a meeting uh, to try and get money to begin the expedition series. And um, there were two doors, one for in the Arts Council, one for film, documentary, and one for, for art. And <laughs> <laughs> we went into the art fund and the guy literally said, oh, sorry, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> but that sense, that sense of our inappropriateness um, was very marked, you know. Um, and that's the major shift. That's a really major shift. So if you went into the BBC uh, archive in the 80s, Someone followed you around, <laughs> <laughs> fearing that you might walk away with something. <laughs> and now we're left in spaces for hours to do what we want. You know, that's a major change. Now, I, I mean, uh, the problem with homilies like this is sometimes it, it comes with a kind of excess of vanity. And the vanity then starts to try and speak for everything. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm not going to tell you that this trajectory somehow suggests that things are better or worse <laughs> for race relations <laughs> in Britain, but they are certainly better for us. Yeah. Well, I think that also, you know, um, hopefully what people come across, I think those pieces still speak to each other in a very powerful way, and I think yeah. that says a lot about what has not, you know, there's a reason why those questions that those pieces ask still, you know, uh, still feel Indeed. as powerful Indeed. today. I well, think. I mean, all I'm saying is that um, uh, uh, I don't have to uh, get on my knees and beg somebody at the BBC to let us <laughs> in. They do that now. Are they doing the same for younger black artists? I don't know, but I, I suspect there's a little bit of what I went through still going on, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, um, but one of the reasons why uh, they obviously now respect and think we're doing something of value is because there are certain recurring themes, uh, not just in terms of subject matter, but also in our approach. Like from the beginning, um, I was very clear with them that we were gonna do two things, right? that we wanted the best quality that we can get of this material. Mm -hmm. So there's a sort of double movement at work. I mean, I'm trying to both accept and embrace and celebrate great work by predecessors, you know, and some of it is truly great. I mean, Vertigo C, the old man who you see in it comes from a film that Ken Russell, great film mm -hmm. that Ken Russell did of Bella Bartok. It's a fiction and the guy's a, an actor, but it's a really good drama documentary, you know, it's from 64. Um, so, there are these great things that were made, shown probably once or twice, and then buried. Mm -hmm. you know. So we're kind of, part of our obligation to that dead is to say, okay, we will resurrect you in the best possible way that we can. And the promise we're making to you is the promise of immortality. You will live forever <laughs> with us. I mean, it's a crass thing to say to the dead, but, <laughs> <laughs> but usually they believe it and they come along, you know. Um, but the other is to say, 
we will interrogate this. You know, um, yes, you're going to come in, but you come in um, in dialogue with with other things, including our own very high demands that we're going to make off you. You know, um, so if you are a film. Uh, current affairs news program from 1964. No, you can't come in and call black people colored folk, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. No, you can't come in and, um, and say things which are unacceptable now to us. It might still be to you, but you have to persuade each other that yeah. this dialogue is possible. You know, so I'm respecting the authority and grace and everything that you are, but equally you need to accept that I have certain demands that I'm making by this invitation. And in that painful way, we, we arrive at something, you know, and that's a recurring thing. So there's, yeah. there's the respect and also the judgment, the call uh, for what has to be, which is that you have to be unmade in mm -hmm. some way, you know, um, in order to take part in this. Even if you said the greatest thing, <laughs> something still has to be given up in order for you to take part in this. Because there are other actors in this drama, uh, not just you. Um, the, the other thing which I've been absolutely fascinated by with all of them, and I think it's, it's really interesting that you've shown Signs of Empire and, and um, Vertigo C, because there is a line, and it's, and it's an interest in it, uh, the beginning of Science and Empire says, uh, as a subtitle, an investigation into colonial fantasy. Well, I mean, really what we meant is a certain form of masculinity, uh, a colonial masculinity, which uh, imperial masculinity, which spoke in a certain way both about the world, subject around it, and how one be becomes in that world, you know? Um, inscriptions of we, they, etc. cetera, et cetera you know, all kinds of authorities that are set up as discriminatory powers and blah, 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 blah. Well, it, that's the same masculinity that I'm sort of tracking in different yeah. forms mm -hmm. in Vertigo C. You know, it's the Ahab, it's the, you know, Steve Jobs. <laughs> it's, yeah. the, it's the sense that somehow, you know, what matters, what you will, as Ahab says, you will do, you know, that your appetites have to be met by all means necessary because that is the authority, you know. Um, I've been interested in that and it's still an interest for <laughs> me <laughs> because it transmutates and, you know, transmogifies and changes, but, but it's the same thing for me, you know. Mm. Well, I think um, it's, I, it's interesting the, the potential for that material to transform over time, I think it's really interesting. Mm. And it, it's also part of the reason why I really wanted to show Transfigured Night as well, because I think right. it's also, you know, the kind of, um, uh, the, the both the kind of the potential and the disappointment of that moment. Um, it's not just a moment in history, it's still something that is resonating and speaking out, mm. which I think, the, you know, a, a lot of the original material in that film speaks to. Um, you know, I'm wondering how you, um, does that is that piece for you function uh, within that di dialogue in the same yes, way? Because no, I know it is a little bit of a lesser known work within, um, you know. But and I think you were also like sort of surprised that we, we asked for that <laughs> for that one in particular. Um, it's uh, it's one of the ones that you know I wanted to tinker with, and in the end I decided not to because it's partly uh, too close. It's a kind of, uh, but it's also. Um, too close because it's, it's lots of autobiographical stuff there that makes me uncomfortable still. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also the closest to working with the idea of a palimpsest that I've I've got to so far. You know, um, the very very obvious um, palimpsest that we're playing with there. One is the the name itself, Transfigured Night, the Klakta Nakt. Uh, it's a piece by Schoenberg, which itself was a sort of use of a, um, of a poem by Robert Demerol. Mm -hmm. And the story of, of, 
of the poem is, is an interesting one for me because it's a story about uh, uh, two lovers who are walking in a forest and um, the woman says to the man, I have a, uh, a secret lover and uh, I am carrying the child of that secret lover. And um, uh, the man says, well, um, <laughs> that's difficult, but we will, on this night, our love will transfigure this uh, blip, <laughs> and we will become will become new. Uh, and that's where the poem actually ends with them walking off into the moonlit night. And in a way, there's something about that which has a sort of allegorical value for me. And the the relationship between the post-colonial subject and the post-colonial states. Because on the eve of independence, it's kind of what happens, you know? Um, the post-colonial state, having been loved um, for a number of centuries by other authorities, usually European ones, has to make this confession to the post-colonial subject by saying, well, actually, I'm not completely yours, you know, I'm, I'm carrying all sorts of uh, babies. Um, and the post-colonial subject was absolutely faithful. He said, no, it's fine. We will raise this child together. Um, and it's that betrayal which makes, it's a betrayal of that love, that fidelity, which made the post-colonial state, such a troublesome thing for me, you know, um, because it betrayed it in a way which is sort of unforgivable. <laughs> it betrayed it uh, in a condition of narcolepsy. Um, it said to uh, the post-colonial subject, in the main, in the main, there were exceptions, but in the main, Anything that's good, I'll be there. So there is, um, you know, Kufuet um, Boigny and uh, um, what's his name? The Nigerian. Uh, oh, his name will come in a minute. Um, uh, Siddiqui Baka Baba. We'll come in a minute. No, 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 I can't remember now. But yeah. Yeah, but you know, mm. oh, well, yeah, mm. well, there's the aid, and they're there signing it and taking it. But as soon as there was problem, famine, disaster, the state disappears. It just vanishes, <laughs> evaporates almost. Um, so I wanted to try and do something about that condition of narcolepsy. I wanted to do something also about the promise uh, and, and, the, and the claims of fidelity that the post-colonial subject made when it, you know, um, now, I, you know, at a certain point, I wander into the field of, of ignorance because I haven't grown up in Africa. You know, my, my sense of it comes from being a child there and mm -hmm. what I've read and experienced going there occasionally. So I didn't want to go too far. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted it to stay at the level of the allegorical because I'm not entirely confident with, with dealing with the, the sociological in that way. But, uh, um, the outlines of what I'm saying in that piece is something I believe profoundly, deeply, um, uh, that there was this betrayal and that there was this moment of fidelity, of declarations of fidelity on the part of the post-colonial subject. So it's different uh, as a piece from many of the ones that I've worked on in the past because in the main, most of it has been about the diaspora. Right. You know. Um, but it's also very similar because it's it's probably the most uh, pure illustration of the palimpsest that, that um, any of the works are. I mean, it's, it's probably the most direct. You know, it's it in you know the 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 trans Schoenberg piece is in five movements. <laughs> it's missing. You know, I mean, the, right. to the to the breakdown of it. You know. Yeah, no, I think that's why we that structure is is very clear, and that's you know part of the reason it shows it. But also, I think you know how. Um, how much you you feel that history, I think, also comes through very strongly. I think it's also in the catalog. You know, Oakley, um, 
you know, <laughs> gravitated towards it immediately um, and connected to Testament and I think a lot of other things that, you know, also connect to things at Oakley and, and we've talked about over the years. So um, we've, we've gone on for quite a bit, so Too I want to open... <laughs> oh, no, it's Sorry. my fault, but um, I want to open the floor to some questions. Um, and I think somebody has a microphone out there. Uh, Andrea does, so... Any questions? Uh, yeah, third row right here. Hi, good evening. <laughs> Thank you so much for this conversation. It's so um, mind-opening. Um, but I wanted to interrogate a little bit the, the, the term post-colonial subject, mm -hmm. um, because it inherently implies that the state of being colonized is not the entity that subjugates, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, how would you articulate this larger entity that's, that's really framing the relationship between the colonizer and the, the subject, the, the, the colonized? Good question. Um, is there any other questions? <laughs> 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 so that I can take them all together? <laughs> I'm happy to try, but is, are there any other questions in that area? Maybe we take two or three and then we can fuse them into one. Indeed. Answer, Indeed. So uh, thank you as well for uh, the conversation. Really appreciate it. Um, I have a question about the Los Angel of History, which was a uh, hugely impactful um, film for me as a, as a sound artist. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of um, this kind of like secret technology um, that you're expressing in it. Um, and this like, this kind of like um, art as like a like secret form of communication, and I'm wondering if you could like, if you've if you've traced that history at all just for yourself since the making of that film, um, and if you could comment on like how that, how you see that idea is like progressing since since the '90s when you made it. Wow, <laughs> no easy ones. Eh? <laughs> so only how that relates to the post-colonial subject. Where's um. the how's the weather ones? <laughs> um, well, because they're so different, I'm going to try and, um, and deal with them differently. I mean, my my uh, invoking the term the post-colonial subject it owes a lot to Achille's notion of a post-colony. Uh, and if you buy the premise of the post-colony, that there was this space uh, that one could call a post-colony, then I think it goes without saying that there has to necessarily have been subjects who inhabit that post-colony. Um, now, whether you choose to call them post-colonial subjects or not is, is um, not too important for me. Um, providing one accepts that if the post-colony constitutes a form of well, structures of governmentality which impinge on lives. As long as we keep that, I'm very happy to call it whatever one wants to. Um, so in shorthand terms, for me, the post-colonial subject is the subject formed, raised, over-determined by the structures of the post-colony. And I think I shield arguments for the post-colonial are pretty compelling, you know. Um, Last Angel, um, you know, it's like one of those moments when there was a kind of euphoria. Um, it's not entirely mine. It was, it was very much a kind of generational thing. And I, I, I worked quite hard with a whole range of people, you know, uh, Derek May and Mad Mike, and, uh, you know, the musicians in Detroit, Kojo Eshin and uh, Greg Tate, all sorts of people to, to try and give some shape and outline to, to what that energy uh, series of insights could be named as. And, and we settled on the term Afrofuturism. Um, does it still have 
longevity. Well, clearly, you know, <laughs> it's, it's gone a long way since, you know, you can now make Hollywood films on that premise <laughs> and make billions, you know, so <laughs> it's clearly got legs. Um, what it says about that movement is difficult to tell. I mean, in part, what happens is that when things become truly global, and Detroit Techno became that. You know, um, the vectors that define it then spread virally everywhere. And each space in which it finds a new abode or home generates new questions. And you know, so in a way, it's too big now <laughs> to do the kind of thing that we were trying to do with it. You know, you can't. I'm not sure that you could do that anymore. Uh, but you could do more local stuff with it. You know, um, uh, both politically, culturally, and musically, sonically. You know, um, but no, I'm not. You know, I I wouldn't make a part two of it, <laughs> if that makes sense. Another question um, over there on the left. How do you, when you have more than one screen, how do you think about? What goes on, say, the center or the left or the right? You know, what's that interplay, or do you privilege one screen over another? Good, good, good That's question. a good question. I mean, there, there's a sort of there's a way in which um, <laughs> the minute you start working on three screens, you realize how much of our ways of seeing, listening, hearing in the West in particular, are conditioned in a very, very specific way. You know, um, the things being cold left to right, for instance, you know, I didn't realize that. Uh, I tried in the very beginnings to make things where things were coming all over the, the place. So we start sequences in the right and work across the left, and I realized I was uncomfortable with it, you know. Um, so many of the uh, many of the strategies, narrative strategies at work in all of these multi-screens are in part investigations of the perceptual limits, <laughs> my own perceptual limits. Um, and I have found over the years, in the last 10 that we've been doing this, um, that voices inevitably, out of all the sonic possibilities, voices are the most arrogant. <laughs> They're the ones that insist the most that they have to be center. <laughs> and once you've understood this, you can play with it. You know, that's its yearning and it's what you want for things to be, to emanate in the center. And I, I try to, in the main, I kind of yield to that, but I try to vary the sonic textures of it, and uh, I might try and wrap things left to right or right to left, but sideways rather than front, you know. Um, so I guess the shortest, uh, the, the easiest thing to say is that sound and images make different demands. There is a regime of looking that you know is at work in the West, and you're playing with that a lot of the time. A lot of the time, that's really what I'm doing playing with your sense of what's appropriate, how images should work. Uh, but I'm also testing myself about the limits of intelligibility with the sonic uh, by accepting that there are four planes in which these things are working. There's definitely a left, front, back, left, and right. You know, uh, and the question is, when you've got 14 channels of sound, well, seven here, but <laughs> I worked with 14 in the past. When you've got 14 channels, the sky is both the limit and the challenge, you know. Um, this is, it's all up for grabs. It's time to, you know, um, no one piece answers all the questions. They all throw up very different ones. Okay, question, um, maybe right here in front. Since you wanted something a bit simpler, but to Joel, so kind of carry on what you were just talking about. 
I wanted to ask you about the sonic aspect of, of your work. Mm. In, in particular, how you source music. So I've, always been, I've been following your work for since the 90s, mm. and I've always been really struck by what music you use. So, for example, when you the one film where you used mainly ECM, records, I was really like, he's using ECM, oh my God. This is just <laughs> like, was like, it's like w worlds that you know and love colliding, and then, and then seeing the film and understand, you actually picked these, all these ECM things that I didn't know with the exception of one thing, and I was like, there's only one thing I know, I don't know ECM. You know, and it's something I'm, you know, <laughs> you're following these trains. And then in, 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 in the Stuart Hall film, there was, I can't even remember the music, but the music reminded me of, I mean, I was born in the mid 60s in the mm -hmm. north of England, I'm from Yemeni family, but all of the music in the early part of the Stuart Hall film especially, and the, the sounds, they were like the sounds of my childhood, and I was like, how is, how is this happening? So the way you're using sound, it's not just like, as it's used conventionally in films, it's it's as a kind of m memory and a, a kind of it's a there's an, a, could you just I can't really even articulate what I'm trying to say, but what? I think you know what I'm <laughs> what trying to say. say. <laughs> <laughs> and just basically like I'm going through the same thing as you. I, do. You know, I know. <laughs> They're just the sonic and you know how you find music. Actually, I'm really curious just how you find music in general to use. Or what kind of that process is? Is it people recommending it? How, how it? how much music are you listening to all the time? What kind of music are you listening to? All those kind of general I've leading got, to I've the past. I've gotten lazier uh, over, over the years. <laughs> I'm listening to less and less. But there was a time um, when it was pretty much all we listened to. I mean, I remember... Uh, this is a very illustration but it it tells you something about the obsessive nature of it trevor matheson the sound designer and i were at college together and i remember the day new order released blue monday the 12 inch we bought it and we played it a whole day like over You know what I mean? Yeah, but you couldn't you couldn't quite get your head around this. There was this cover which was the most extraordinary thing I'd ever seen. You know, a floppy disk, and, and you put this music on, and you could tell that it was like a kind of synthesis of all sorts of things that you've been listening to. You know, um, so the the obsessive quest for the unusual in the sonic can go in that post-punk direction. Post-punk helped people like me enormously. Dub helped people like me enormously. It, the two helped you to get used to, to things which were um, not musical per se. You know, you stand in a dub space and the bass just says, I don't care who you are. But let's remember also the two had a very, very direct Indeed. physical contact. Indeed. Right. For Indeed. us, I mean, I'm a post-punk generation. I, I used to drink in the same bar right. as Cabaret Voltaire. I, I was, the right. drummer from Hula was my best mate, you right. know. Yeah. The, the context for punk gigs or post-punk gigs, mm -hmm. the music you heard in between the bands was always dub, mm -hmm. always. Mm. Even even the whitest, whitest bands yeah. would have dub in between. Indeed. It was this kind of bizarre, Indeed. strange thing. No, I worked I worked in a, in a shop. Uh, if you ask me where it comes, I worked in a shop on Saturdays with uh, a guy called Don Letts, and Don Letts became uh, the man who in 76 played, was the DJ for the punks at the, the club called the Roxy. Because He's the guy. Yeah. He's the guy that did it. Because punk didn't have any music, but, uh, that's one side. The, the, the side that I've learned the most from, though, is jazz, uh, and free jazz in particular. Um, because free jazz is not, it's not music, it's a credo. Well, that's interesting, because I haven't heard free jazz. You, you might need to give up that mic. <laughs> I know, but I, haven't, but I haven't heard free jazz in any of your films, though. 
<laughs> have you I used free jazz in that, any of your but films? That's why I said it's a credo because it's about an approach. You know what I mean? It's about an approach to not simply the sonic, but to that great big slab of the philosophical that we call time. It's an approach to time. That's what free jazz is. It's about the splintering, the reordering, and the reconfiguring of time. Um, and once, once it's told you that, you never forget it, you know. Uh, and it's it's the thing that I learned the most from Who, whoever, you know. The first time you hear Coltrane's Ole or my favorite things or Albert Ayler or you know Bill, whoever Dixon, you know. It's the thing that that sticks with you. That sense that somehow someone's saying to you, "I'm going to take the familiar, and in the very very cubist way." rearrange it for you and it will still look like a human figure in the landscape you know that that ability to do that was was the single most important influence on, on us really and and on, on my sense of what music is so whether it's tibetan chants from you know uh, the gore temple whether it's uh, nusrat fatah ali khan or um, you know bim singh joshi from New Delhi or whoever, in the Arbo Pert or, you know, that's what I'm listening for. It's, it, it doesn't make matter, make sense to me as music. It's what is its take on time? And is it any use to me? <laughs> <laughs> Selfishly. <laughs> so we are just about out of time. We have time for one more very short, very excellent question. So, so <laughs> you're still <laughs> you're thinking twice. <laughs> no weather ones, right? All right. Well, uh, maybe uh, since you seem hesitant, we're going to go with you. <laughs> Hi, uh, I went to a talk a couple of years ago at the New York Public Library, and it was Salman Rushdie interviewing Marlon James, the Jamaican novelist, and uh, they were both talking about how they didn't really feel like they were commonwealth writers anymore um, and how like the British Empire didn't really have anything to do with like the subject matter and what they were writing. And I was just curious if you thought maybe that was just wishful thinking on their part, at least with your answer of the first question. Um, well, you know, as the, um, <laughs> the call girl said to the vicar, you know, you would, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> they don't, you know, neither of them need particularly to be in that frame, uh, it's, it's just in, it's disingenuous. It's that's what I meant earlier about trying to use one's autobiography to make bigger claims about the planet. You know, um, are there Commonwealth writers? Yes. Is Salman Rushdie and Marlon James Commonwealth writers? No. Does that tell us anything at all about the world? No. <laughs> you know. They're Commonwealth writers and they're non-Commonwealth writers. That's it. But I, that's not what they're interested in. Both of them are trying to use it to say something else. And it's something else that I dispute. You know, I have no, no quarrel with them disclaiming, disavowing the label. Fine, no problem. Um, does, it carry, does the disavowal itself carry a bigger, more profound truth? No. Actually, a very banal insight. <laughs> you know, people who are and people who are not. I mean, big deal. <laughs> Let's move on. They're not my favorite writers, <laughs> <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> John, thank you so much um, for this talk, for this amazing show, and also to David and Lena. Um,